in America, and that's certainly true when it comes to their love of cars. In the US, they are so much more than just a means of getting from A to B. With more cars and trucks than drivers, this country has a history and culture that's been shaped by the humble automobile. We're here to find out why. Welcome to The Travel Show, coming from the American Midwest. Now, this week we're off on a bit of a road trip to discover how this country has been shaped, and some might say even dominated by one simple machine, the motor car. It's almost impossible to come to the US as a traveler and not see the huge impact of car culture. In this century, America has become a nation on wheels. On this road trip, I'll be driving from the prairie state of Illinois up through Michigan and onto Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm trying to find out why this country has so fallen for the humble automobile and to see for myself how cars play an important role in US life. It's an American thing. Everybody likes their car. Everybody wants to go fast. On my journey, I'll meet some four-wheeled celebrities and even get to take one for a spin. Well, it's certainly the most interesting car I've ever driven. <laughs> I'll explore America's seemingly unquenchable need for speed. And I'll see for myself how changes in the car industry have had a huge impact on Motor City, Detroit. The floor's all buckled, there's glass everywhere. What an extraordinary sight. But first, I'm taking a drive on a road that embodies why America fell in love with its cars. It's known as the Mother Road, Route 66. At well over 2,000 miles long, Route 66 stretched from Chicago in the north right through to Los Angeles in the west. It hasn't actually been an official highway for three decades now, but the road still resonates with the people of America. To find out why, I've come to a festival thrown in its honour. There are so many cars here that really evoke the spirit of the heyday of Route 66, like Thunderbirds and Hot Rods and Cadillacs. And it really underlines the obsession that this country has with their automobiles. So what made this road so famous? And what can it tell us about America's love of cars? It never was intended to be what it is today. They needed a road that was a hard road, paved of one form or another. And so what they did is they, they took pieces of road that were already paved and they attached them. Ah, but this made all kinds of curves and hairpin turns, making Route 66 known as Bloody 66. It was a dangerous road to drive. But it was paved. Wow! In 1938, Route 66 became the first highway in the United States to be completely paved. With these new highways come new advances in engineering. And above all, the savings of man's greatest asset, time. This new modern highway became a vital road for those traveling west in search of a new life. And as the US's economy rocketed after years of depression, Route 66 and the cars that drove on it began to embody the freedom that the American dream offered. Get your kicks on Route 66. It may not all be particularly scenic, and to be honest, there are quite long stretches of fairly ordinary road. But there is something still quite cool about driving Route 66. And this road is also a prime example of just what a powerful force this love of cars can be for US tourism. Like in Atlanta, Illinois. Ten years ago, the main street of this little town was in serious decline, and lots of these shops and businesses were boarded up. And today, it's undergoing a revival, and it's all thanks to Route 66. 
I've come to meet Atlanta local Bill Thomas at the Retro Palm Grills Cafe. So what's the importance of Route 66 to this town? It has helped save it economically. This building was actually ready to fall down and we needed to save it somehow. And all of a sudden it dawned on us, oh my gosh, we have a tremendous potential asset in this strip of highway that runs right through the middle of our community. The potential for Route 66 tourism kicked the town into action. A museum was set up and this cafe was rebuilt exactly like it was in 1934, right down to the smallest detail. Our goal is when a tourist walks in the door, we want them to feel like they've been taken back in time. Before 2009, when the cafe opened, we didn't have tourists coming to Atlanta. And this year, we've had well over 3,000 tourists come. And what would a visit to a classic diner be without a slice of homemade apple pie? So this is like the ultimate American dish, isn't oh, it? Oh, it doesn't get any more American apple than pie. apple pie. That's pretty good. The diner has been a huge success for Atlanta, and it's a recipe that's been replicated all the way along the road. In fact, it's estimated that tourists spend $38 million each year along this decommissioned highway. But while some sites thrive, others have gone to ruin. This used to be known as John's Modern Cabins, which, if you look at it today, seems rather ironic. Believe it or not, it was a Route 66 hotspot. There was a dance hall and cabins like these where travellers would come to break their journey along the main road. Route 66 had become a victim of its own success. By the 50s, the road was bumper to bumper. In fact, America's whole highway network needed updating, and in 1956, plans for a new interstate system were announced. We are gathered here today to dedicate a new highway, one segment of a great national system of highways that one day soon will connect the major cities of our land. With many travellers taking the faster interstates, tourist spots like this found themselves cut off from the travellers that they needed to survive. The site was abandoned in the 1970s and pretty soon I can imagine it would be completely collapsed. But for now, it's this kind of eerie reminder of the glory days of Route 66. It was the end of an era for this legendary highway, but America's love of the open road had just begun. Over the decades, cars have influenced so many aspects of life here. From its sprawling cities to vast suburban shopping malls, modern America is built around automobiles. And what's more, they've become far more than just a mode of transport. I've left Route 66 and come to the very western edge of Illinois. This is Cordova Dragway Park, where locals come to drive in their own cars in a straight line as fast as they can go. This is a drag strip, and we race 1,320 feet, which is a quarter mile. And to improve your speed by, it sounds ridiculous, but by a tenth of a second is tremendous. The cars that are lining up to race aren't being driven by professional racers. These guys have paid to come here and there's something rather striking about some of their ages. Hello. OK, I have to ask, how old are you? 16. Oh, my goodness. I'm in high school still. 
That's a, how old are you? 16. No way. Yep. This is this your truck? Yep. This is my grandpa's. Your, yep. gra your grandpa's let you bring his car out yep. here. Does he know about it? Yes, he does. <laughs> and it's better to do it here than on the road. The purpose is to get street racers off the street. But we give them a very safe, controlled place to come out and run their cars. It, it's an American thing. Everybody likes their car. Everybody wants to go fast. In the US, driving has clearly become a serious pastime in its own right. Everybody has their thing that they love to do. Like, you have your hobbies, I have mine, and mine's just being here on the coldest night of the year so far. Scenes like this are happening right across the country, and it's not just drag racing. Whether it's gigantic monster trucks performing acrobatics, or NASCAR racing, a sport that's claimed to be second only to American football in its number of US fans. The thrills offered up by what might seem to be just a simple mode of transport have become a big part of life for many Americans. Man, it's just got to be American spirit, I guess. We got gas in our veins. Coming up on The Travel Show. We'll explore the troubled history of a city that was once the powerhouse of the US car industry. And I get taken for a spin in the car of the future. Or should I say, by the car of the future. In the grocery store, they don't come up to you and say, hey, I'd like to go out on a date. But on our time, they do. It was really nice to be on a site where gentlemen are actually looking for someone of my age. And then they match you up with somebody that has the same likes and the same values. I feel like I'm back in high school. I got my first flirt within about 10 minutes of being on the site, yeah. <laughs> OurTime.com. Visit today and get started for free. On the beautiful island of St. Lucia, only at Sandals can you stay at one resort and play around at all three. Play around wherever you want. Play around as often as you like. Dine around at 23 gourmet restaurants. Enjoy unlimited rounds on us. Why, you can even sleep in the round. Sandals Resorts in St. Lucia. Get three vacations for the price of one. Call 1-800-SANDALS. Every child deserves a good education and the chance to realize their dreams. The Kuwait Fund is building schools, universities, and training centers throughout the developing world, ensuring a better life for future generations. Since 1961, the Kuwait Fund, helping people help themselves. The four fresh books, life was chaotic. Confusing. The accounting software I was using before FreshBooks felt awful. I was using uh, notepads. It was on sticky notes. The shoe box full of receipts. I hated doing it so much that I wouldn't send out an invoice for months. If you love your small business, but not the paperwork, FreshBooks is cloud-based accounting software that makes things like sending invoices, tracking time, and capturing expenses a breeze. Now with FreshBooks, I really feel like an accounting superman. It gives us a more professional look. I get paid three times faster. I can use FreshBooks on my phone, at the bank, at the post office. Go to my client's name and invoice them, and it's done. FreshBooks saves me five to 10 hours every week. Join five million people already using FreshBooks. Start saving time, getting paid faster, and growing your business. Just go online now and sign up for your 30-day free trial. No credit card needed. Go to FreshBooksTrial.com today. Remove all doubt. Just use FreshBooks. I'm on a road trip exploring the US and its love affair with cars. And my next stop is the village of Volo, 50 miles north of Chicago. I'm here to see a remarkable collection of automobiles, one that shows us how the car has taken pride of place in American culture. We've got Stephen King's killer car, Christine. There's Kit from the TV series Knight Rider and 
my personal favourite, the DeLorean from Back to the Future. This is the Volo Auto Museum, and it's chock full of celebrity cars. What's more, most of them are still in running order. And as a special treat, they're letting me get behind the wheel of a true icon of American culture. So this is probably the first time I'll get to say this and really mean it. To the Batmobile. Okay, I'm not nervous driving the Batmobile. Come on. Playing Robin to my Batman is Brian Grams. Sorry. Well, not off to the smoothest of starts. See, that's what happens when you're in a Batmobile. Everyone lets you through. People are more friendly when you're in the Batmobile. They'll stop for you. <laughs> okay, now younger viewers may be a little confused here because this doesn't look anything like the Batmobile that they've seen in the movies. This is from the original 1960s series starring Adam West. And even five decades later, this famous car can still turn heads. Every single person who's passing us giving us a big smile. <laughs> this car has become more famous than the actor who drove it. If you park this in a, uh, in a parking lot, there's a brand new Lamborghini. People will walk over the Lamborghini to see this car. <laughs> I bet they will. There's something enormously satisfying about that. So if we hang a right here. Cars like the Batmobile remind us that many Americans no longer see cars as just machines. Well, it's certainly the most interesting car I've ever driven. <laughs> They've become characters with personalities of their own. Yes! Best thing ever. So far on my journey, we've seen how automobiles have played a vital role in America's history and its culture. So it's probably not surprising that the US is a car manufacturing powerhouse too, second only to China. But it hasn't all been smooth sailing. My next stop was once one of the wealthiest cities in America, but today it's in serious trouble. This is Detroit, also known as Motor City, and with good reason. In the first half of the 20th century, 125 car companies were based here. Detroit today stands at the threshold of a bright new future. In the 50s and 60s, this city was a paragon of capitalist progress thanks to the motor trade. But the glory days couldn't last forever. Smaller manufacturers were pushed out of business and those that survived used increasingly automated production lines. Soon, the work dried up and residents began to abandon Detroit in droves. Today, Detroit is full of abandoned buildings and it's perhaps not surprising when you consider that since the heyday of the city in the 1950s, the population has declined by more than half. But this decay is becoming an unlikely tourist attraction. Oh my goodness, look at this. Jesse Welter is a local photographer. He's taking a group of us to see sites that you may not find in the guidebooks. Abandoned buildings, you know, schools, churches, warehouses, I mean, you name it, it's out here and there's a lot of it. We're in Southwestern High School. Once, 1,600 students roamed these halls. Many of them probably had parents working in the car factories that Detroit was famous for. It's just one of over 100 schools that the city has closed since 2005. There's still enough here to give a really strong sense of what this place would have been like. You can completely imagine these bleachers full of cheering students and people playing basketball. Yet the floor's all buckled, there's glass everywhere, and it's completely open to the elements. It's quite an extraordinary sight. Our pub is probably be our last stop. Uh, St. Agnes Church School, uh, there's a convent. This is St. Agnes Church in the Virginia Park District. It's such an extraordinary building, and yet it's on a list for demolition, and who knows how long it'll be here.
It's a breathtaking sight, but it's hard to forget that Detroit's troubles brought about by the motor trade have had a very real impact on many of the people who live here. Some people say that there could be a level of exploitation in artists coming here and taking advantage of these very striking sites and that it's not really helping anything. What's your view on that? You know, I didn't do this. You know, I'm just showing you what it looks like, you know. Um, there is beauty and decay. There is um, lots of you know, artistic value and stuff like this. Seeing these buildings going to ruin, it's very easy to assume that Detroit has become a ghost town. But the blight has actually provided some with opportunities. Before I leave Detroit, I'm on my way to see a man who's created something quite remarkable out of his corner of Motor City. This was the first mural that uh, will grab the attention of the general public. This is Darbles. He's an artist who has created a huge outdoor installation in the heart of the city. When the city was uh, barren, so-called blight, those were my happy days, because where did I get all this materials from? I saw it as a great opportunity to use stuff to build stuff. As well as murals and sculptures, he's even transformed some of the abandoned buildings themselves. And he doesn't recognize the doom and gloom stories about his city. I can see that there's a, a great uh, spirit of energy, a mental attitude that people have now that was not there a year ago. The changing car industry has clearly had a huge impact on the city of Detroit and the people who live here. And there are those who claim that US car culture itself is on the wane as people seek out greener options like cycling and public transport. But it seems to me that perhaps it's not dying. Perhaps it's just evolving. The last stop on my journey is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm here to get a glimpse of America's motoring future. This might look like a fairly ordinary car, but believe it or not, this is the future of automotive technology. Look closer and you'll see the car is covered in hidden sensors and cameras. There's also a not so hidden emergency stop button. That's all because this car can drive itself. Okay, so at the moment there's a man behind the wheel. This is Jared Snyder from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, so right now I'm, I'm manually driving, so it's like a, it's like a normal car. You can, you can flip this switch, it will go into uh, uh, autonomous driving. mode. You can feel it slow down a little bit, I think I was speeding. <laughs> okay, this is really weird. The car is now entirely on autopilot. Jared isn't touching any of the controls. So we're making the, the left turn here. <laughs> that is bizarre to watch the steering wheel just moving by itself. You can be more productive. You can email, uh, read, maybe take a nap or something like that on your commute to work. Um, but but more, than, more than that, I think some people, as they, as they get older, they might lose the ability to, to drive. It's a very strange experience to be watching the wheel, doing little adjustments, turning corners, putting on indicators. But in some ways, it really feels like a normal person's driving. And because the car looks like an ordinary car, it somehow feels like this technology isn't that far out of reach. It could be a few decades before you get one of these as your holiday rental car. But one thing is certain, America's love affair with the car is not over. And it's exciting to think how the country will adapt as its favourite mode of transport continues to evolve. I've reached the end of my journey, and at every turn I've seen the huge impact that this seemingly simple machine has had on America. In many ways, the story of the automobile is the story of the US. It's played a central role in shaping the country that we know today. Cars have become icons of popular culture, 
and a pastime in their own right. They've even contributed to the rise and fall of one of its greatest cities. But the story's not over. The car will continue to shape America's future, even when we humans are no longer required behind the wheel. This is not just a form of transport. Here, it means pride and freedom. And it's something that tourists like me can tap into just by coming here and hitting the open road.